So um, due to some of the difficulties that we had yesterday, uh, particularly with the live stream and the situation there, I've decided that I'm going to record my sermon again uh, now. And um, because it was the first Sunday in Advent, I feel it's appropriate that I'm able to wear a Christmas jumper. Um, and I hope that this might serve well. Um, it was the, the last in our series on the spiritual disciplines. And due to a number of factors, we had to combine all three into this final uh, message. And that's so that we can begin uh, looking at Advent and uh, focusing on the coming of Christ our Lord over the next few weeks in the countdown to Christmas. So this week we're going to be looking at confession, then guidance and worship. As a reminder, the purpose behind each of the disciplines that we've been looking at is that we might become like Jesus Christ. That's the goal for each of our lives, that we're conformed to the image of Christ. Paul writes in Romans 8, 29, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So the goal of your life and the goal of my life is that we might become filled with the holy love of God and changed and transformed, that we become like Jesus Christ, like the Son of God. Uh, John Wesley, who's one of my heroes and the founder of Methodism, said, the gospel of Christ knows of no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. And by social holiness, Wesley didn't mean what we call social justice now, but he's thinking of a holy life, a life set apart for God, and that it can't be lived out alone. Rather, it requires a community to work itself out. In Hebrews 12, 14, we, write, we read, pursue peace with everyone and holiness, for without it, no one will see the Lord. And that's a very scary thought for each of us. That without holiness, we will not see God. Faith that does not produce good works is dead, as James tells us. So if we want to be holy, which I hope all of us do, then we can only live out that holiness in relationship to other Christians. And that's what John Wesley is trying to get at, that when we form these tight knit bonds of community, then we can push one another on towards faith, hope and love. Holiness is all about being set apart for the use of God in the world, being taken out of the world and set apart for Christ. In the Bible, lampstands and clothes, you know, the high priests, robes, etc., all called holy. So holiness cannot be about morality uh, or just about morality, about doing good things and avoiding bad things. Because um, tunics and clothes and crowns aren't morally good or bad. Rather, holiness is about being set apart for the special use of God, to be dedicated to the use of God, to be set apart and separate from the common ordinary things of this world. So in 1738, John Wesley introduced what would become known as band meetings, uh, something he would receive from the Lutheran Moravians. And their purpose was to form groups, small groups for deeper discipleship in the context of strong relationships. And to that end, I would like to promote an app that seeks to do the same thing today. It's called discipleshipbands.com from their website. A discipleship band is a group of three to five people who read together, pray together and meet together to become the love of God for one another and the world. And in the 20 minute meetings, they would ask one another questions. So how is it with your soul? How is it with your soul? And that's a question all of us should ask ourselves regularly. What are your struggles and what are your successes? Because all of us do struggle and all of us have successes. So what are they? We should be looking at that in our own lives. And how might the spirit and the scriptures be speaking into your life? How might the spirit and the scriptures be speaking into your life? The word and the spirit together bring transformation. So we need to hear from them both. And then when they feel comfortable, they can also ask one another, do you have any sin that you would like to confess? Are there any secret or hidden things that we would like to share? 
And I like this model. And I think if you're serious about your spiritual walk, then why not get together in a group of two or three and regularly ask yourself these questions? I found that very helpful in my own life, having other uh, chaps that I can go to and ask these sorts of questions and then confess and talk to one another in a deep and meaningful way as we push each other towards faith, hope and love. So this is the first discipline, namely confession. St. Augustine says confession of evil works is the beginning of good works. Confession is not about making a sin known, but about being sorry for it, about having a desire to put it right. In Luke 19, when Jesus is in Jericho, he encounters a wealthy tax collector named Zacchaeus. There's a children's song about it that you might know. Uh, when Jesus meets him, he says in verse eight, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. So Zacchaeus here is not only sorry for cheating the poor, he decides to pay them back four times the amount and give away half of his possessions. In that great Christian work, The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien shows us what confession looks like. Shortly after Boromir has taken care uh, taken the tried to take the ring from Frodo. The fellowship is scattered. They're attacked by hundreds of orcs. And when the orcs attempt to take Merry and Pippin captive, Boromir defends them, killing at least 20 before he's felled by arrows. He collapses next to a tree and is soon found by Aragorn. Uh, and Aragorn here is an icon of the kingly aspect of Christ. So we've got, you know, Frodo is the priestly aspect and Gandalf is the prophet aspect. All of them die and are raised to life again, you know, within the context of the books. Um, and so here Aragorn as the kingly aspect of Christ comes and finds Boromir dying from his runes. And I read Aragorn knelt beside him. Boromir opens his eyes and strove to speak. At last, slow words came out. I tried to take the ring from Frodo, he said, I'm sorry, and I've paid. His glance strayed to his fallen enemies, 20 at least. They have gone. The halflings, the orcs have taken them. Uh, I think they're not dead. Orcs bound them. And then he paused and closed his eyes wearily. After a moment, he spoke again. Farewell, Aragorn. Go to Minas Tirith and save my people. I have failed. No, said Aragorn, taking his hand and kissing his brow. You have conquered. Few have gained such a victory. Be at peace. Minas Tirith shall not fall. Boromir smiled. Which way did they go? Was Frodo there? Said Aragorn. But Boromir did not speak again. So Boromir here opens with his confession. I tried to take the ring from Frodo, he said. I'm sorry I have paid. And he, he glanced straight to his fallen enemies. Twenty at least lay there. Boromir here acknowledges his fault. He confesses his sins. Um, he sought it to put it right by defending the hobbits against the orcs. And yet, despite confessing his sins and trying to put it right, he still feels guilty. And that can be our experience as well, that although we've confessed our sins, we've tried to put it right, still we can feel guilty. And he says, I have failed. But Aragorn, acting in the place of Christ, gives him the words of absolution. No, says Aragorn, taking his hand, kissing his brow, you have conquered. Few have gained such a victory be at peace. So when we confess our sins, we also receive that kiss of peace. As John says in 1 John 1 9, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. The reason we need to confess our sins is made known in Isaiah 59 verse 2. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he's turned away and will not listen anymore. And Proverbs 28, 13, we read, people who conceal their sins will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. So Peter here echoes this thought in 1 Peter 3, 7, when he speaks to husbands and he says, treat her as you should so that your prayers will not be hindered. Our prayers, friends, can be hindered if we have unconfessed sin or if we're not treating others as we should that's a very scary thought for all of us and we're told in james 5 16 confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results 
And whilst we should always confess our sins to God, it is also good to confess to one another. I have fellow believers in my life who I have confessed my sins towards um, too. I've also opened up about some of those worst thoughts and images that come into my own mind and plague my thoughts. And I've had the same from others, the sins and disturbing and horrifying thoughts that plague their minds so they confess them to me. For the enemy loves to make you feel alone. He loves to make you feel that no one else has these thoughts or desires. And the opposite is the case. These are part of human experience. Often we, we can think the most atrocious of things. And when someone confesses their sins, always pardon it by saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Um, that's because we have that assurance that if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if someone does share a secret, thank them for their courage and never judge. The second practice I would like to focus on today is guidance. How are we to guide one another towards the good, towards God himself? Uh, about the year 395 a young woman a, a brand new christian named florentina wrote to saint augustine to seek his spiritual guidance and before offering her any uh, he wanted to make clear how he understood the relationship not as a superior but someone who is always pointing her towards jesus christ uh, each of us myself included are beggars telling other beggars where to find the bread our role is to point people not to ourselves, but outward to Christ. And that is the role of a spiritual director. Eugene Peterson writes, being a spiritual director, which used to loom large at the very center of every pastor's work in our times, has been pushed to the periphery of ministry. And he sees the role more in terms of prayerful companionship, guiding others towards the good. is an activity directed by the spirit and points others towards Christ himself. Guidance is about knowing who we should go to to get help with our spiritual walks. But we need people who are gonna point us towards Christ, not to themselves, because we don't have all the answers, but Christ himself does. The final discipline I would like to mention today is worship. Uh, worship is a, an act of religious devotion directed towards God. Uh, and it's more about recognition of God, and it could be performed individually or in formal or formal group or by a designated leader. And in Romans 12, verse 1, Paul says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. So for Paul, the way to worship God truly is to give our bodies as living sacrifices, to live for God rather than for ourselves. And in a recent book for the body, Rediscovering a Theology of Gender, Sexuality and the Human Body, Timothy Tennant provides seven building blocks of a theology of the body. Because if our bodies are to be living sacrifices for God, if that's the way we worship God with our bodies, then we need to understand the theology of the body. And number one, God's creation is good. And our physical bodies God made are good. They might be broken, but they're good. Uh, this is the opposite to our culture, which says our hearts are good, but the body might be wrong. In Christ, our bodies are good, but our hearts are deceitful. We have these wrong thoughts, wrong inclinations, wrong desires. Number two, God created us in his image, male and female for redemptive purpose, because physicality matters, that we can uh, choose to give up ourselves to love our neighbor, a self-sacrificial love that is pictured in the icon of marriage, in the image of marriage. And that's why God created us, male and female, that we might learn to be self-sacrificial towards the other. And marriage, number three, this is marriage defined as a man and a woman, shines a theological light upon Christ and his church. It's a, an icon, a window into that reality, that heavenly reality of Christ and the church. Just as Eve is formed out of the body of Adam, out of his side, so the church is formed out of the body of the second Adam, of Christ himself. And we even use that language, Christ, the, the church is the body of Christ. And from his side on the cross come water and blood, namely baptism and holy communion the the water and the wine and those are the things that come for us and unite us to christ and help us to participate in that reality of being his body uh, number four procreation is good 
and how we are co-creators with God to reflect the mystery of the Trinity and how we can flourish in community living. So procreation in marriage points to the church as being the mother, the bride of Christ, birthing children to eternal life. Uh, the, the church gives birth to immortal sons through the waters of baptism. Uh, so through that water, we're birthed into eternal life as sons and daughters of God. In, in the same way as the husband and his wife give, you know, the wife gives birth to children who have the potentiality for eternal life through the, um, through the church, through becoming part of the body of Christ. Uh, number five, apart from the choices of celibacy and marriage, friendship is a valid option and that we need to have a higher view of friendship. You know, the friendship that David and Jonathan have where they loved one another more than they loved, you know, the opposite sex. You know, that's how they present it. You know, they've got such a deep friendship that they're bound together as almost like blood brothers, as it were. That, you know, that, that, that sort of friendship we've lost in the West. Uh, number six, our bodies are to em, uh, embody God's saving purposes and his love. So when God says he loves us, he doesn't send us an email. Rather, he comes as in the flesh, as the son, as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Our bodies embody God's saving purposes and mission in the world. Number seven, mission for gods include the working out of ordinary activities the mission of god isn't just what i do on a sunday or what priests and pastors are doing up and down this country rather it is what everyone is doing every day of the week is you know the ordinary of when we're in our own jobs we're doing it as to the lord because we're doing it in the body everything is spiritual what we do in our bodies are spiritual acts. And so Paul links worship to how we act in the body. Embodiment matters. Matter really does matter. In the words of C.S. Lewis, there's no good trying to be more spiritual than God. God never meant man to be a purely spiritual creature. That's why he uses those material things like bread and wine to put that new life into us. We might think this rather crude and unspiritual, but God does not. He invented eating. He likes matter. He invented it. And this is why, for all the good of online church, it's no substitute for the real thing. That's why I can't wait for next week when we get to go and have physical meetings again. In Hebrews 10, 25, we read, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now the day of his return is drawing near. Physical meetings really do matter. So in conclusion, let us be a community of faith that is marked out by personal confession and an openness towards the good, towards God himself. May we know those faithful uh, shepherds to whom we can go to for guidance, those who will lead us to Christ, not to themselves. And may this be marked out by those who offer their bodies as true worship towards God, trusting that creation is good. Our bodies are good and they're called to reflect those heavenly realities. As Paul says in Philippians 1, 21, 22, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Is, is, if I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Friends, may our lives in the body be a life of fruitful labor. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just come before you now and we pray, Lord, that we might be those people who live our bodies as living sacrifices for you, that every action that we commit this week might be an action for your glory as we live it in the world, as we seek to enjoy you and to delight into you and to reflect your life and light into the world. Amen. <laughs>